Hello, everyone, and welcome to Security in the 21st Century. I'll be your host, Dr. Suzanne Loftus. This video podcast series aims to look at the most pressing security-related challenges in the realm of international relations. It will feature interviews with professionals from academia, international organizations, the private sector, and government. The aim is to try to tie these sectors together into answering questions related to themes such as great power competition, disinformation campaigns, and transatlantic security. So stay tuned. and welcome back to Security in the 21st Century. I'm your host, Dr. Suzanne Lobjes. I'm pleased to have with me on the show today, Ray Wojcik. Hi, Ray, thanks a lot for being here today. Great to be here, Suzanne. Ray has lived and worked in Poland for over 11 years now, working in embassy defense cooperation as an attache, and most recently with the Center for European Policy Analysis, where he's currently a non-resident senior fellow as part of the transatlantic defense and security team. Ray focuses on defense and security issues connected with the Eastern flank. Ray and I both participate on a regular basis in a trilateral dialogue between Germany, the United States, and Poland, now organized primarily by the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. And we talk about the security of uh, NATO's eastern flank, which is the topic of today's podcast. So I wanted to ask Ray uh, several questions about that topic, which uh, is very prominent today and uh, very topical. So first, how about you tell us a little bit about SEPA and your role there as a non-resident senior fellow of the Transatlantic Defense and Security Team? Okay, and, and thanks again, uh, Suzanne, for putting this project together, inviting uh, SEPA to be a partner with you on this one. I'm very much looking forward to uh, our discussion today. So SEPA, you know, is a think tank that started relatively new, still in the you know longer uh, span of think tanks, or about 15 years ago, with a mission to tighten the transatlantic bonds between uh, basically the newer emerging NATO nations and EU nations on NATO's eastern flank. Uh, so um, if you think about the D9 countries, or if you think about everything sort of between Berlin and Moscow, uh, so B9 and all the other former uh, Soviet states or uh, and, and Russia and so forth, and NATO partners, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, um, that's the region that we focus on. So when I was invited to SEPA after working in Poland so many years, uh, I was very excited because uh, I feel like it's at the heart of uh, what I'm most interested in is in um, improving uh, the U.S. relationship with these nations and transatlantic bonds. And that is exactly the SEPA mission, basically Berlin to Moscow and um, tightening those transatlantic bonds, uh, reinforcing uh, democratic values and increasing defense and security capabilities. So that's the SEPA mission and the SEPA vision is uh, to continue the larger European project, European whole free and at peace with itself uh, and SEPA's role in, in that is uh, the probably overarching uh, SEPA mission, but um, we focus on this region and again, the one I'm most interested in. That's great. And so the Eastern flank is a topic that you, that you work with a lot. And so in your opinion, why is it such a hot topic these days? Is it, uh, are we really facing a huge threat by Russia in this region or why is it so important in the security sector to discuss the Eastern flank? Well, you know, we have to go back to more recent history, a little bit farther back into the late 80s, early 90s, when the fall of the Soviet Union, and finally the release of these captive uh, states that were trapped at the end of World War II, uh, you know, and uh, getting um, the former Warsaw Pact states and some of the independent states that were uh, again, trapped behind the Iron Curtain uh, back into uh, Western um, democracy uh, potential, uh, the ability to join NATO, the European Union, and then also uh, strengthen their bonds with the United States. So with that, uh, uh, what we see 
in the 90s and early 2000s with the post-Soviet Union, Russia. And the Russian Federation uh, initially was uh, weakened, of course, by the fall of the Soviet Union and uh, was a little bit, uh, let's say, unsteered for uh, over a decade uh, very strongly. And then uh, President Vladimir Putin came along and things changed. And so since that time, and what we've really seen increasingly since about 2014 um, is a revisionist uh, Russia, threatening its neighbors, uh, using political warfare, economic warfare, energy warfare, disinfo, cyber attacks, and then real uh, hard security uh, threats, whether it's uh, simulated nuclear attacks on allies and partners uh, sim uh, or nuclear threats uh, to allies and partners, strengthening uh, everything between the Barents and uh, Black Sea and the Mediterranean, uh, fighting proxy wars in the region. Those kinds of uh, things have totally changed the dynamic. Those are real threats felt very, very uh, strongly uh, with our allies and partners in the region. And that's one of the things I think we'll talk about a little bit later about threat perception. That's, uh, that remains an issue um, for the West and for NATO to sort out how we really see Russia. But my perspective, SIPA's perspective, uh, Russia a real physical threat and Russia a real uh, soft power threat in the region to, uh, to our allies and partners. Thank you for that explanation. But uh, yes, indeed, the threat perception among the allies is something rather challenging these days. So as you mentioned, uh, countries located in the, the region on the eastern flank oftentimes um, are perhaps have a heightened threat perception of Russia based on their history, as you so well explained. But then other countries in Europe, maybe in the south or in the west, don't share the same history and may not share the same view. So in your opinion, uh, do the Allies share uh, the common threat perception on Russia or are they kind of disunited on that front? And if so, what explains that? Mm -hmm. The answer is uh, yes uh, and yes uh, to both. Um, so on the positive side, it, it, the Allies have actually, because of the response uh, we've seen in the region by NATO especially, um, but not only um, by EU sanctions on Russia vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and so forth, those demonstrate that there is some base level of understanding of the threat of Russia and what Russia has been doing uh, either below the table, as General Breedlove, uh, you know, so eloquently refers to all that, the below the table tools the Russians use and uh, the above board uh, physical uh, presence uh, threats Russia uh, um, projects in the region. So, um, so on the good side, there is some base level understanding among NATO and the EU. Uh, on the downside, though, it, you know, NATO is made up, and so is the EU, of course, of uh, uh, dozens of democratic states with uh, different histories, as you mentioned, different views, different relationships uh, with Russia. So even on the eastern flank, um, you, where you would think uh, there would be a lot more solidarity, you know, among the NATO allies, uh, we have a significant uh, divergence uh, when we get to the Black Sea region on the threat perception about Russia. So just on the eastern flank, uh, of course, when we get to uh, the Western allies uh, with uh, uh, larger uh, economic uh, military potential and a, a strategic depth uh, difference than the frontline states, uh, we talk about France and Germany and so on, a, a totally uh, different uh, perception on the, especially the real military threat, whether it's a military capability, uh, but it's more about, uh, from their perspective, it's more about the political and, and the will uh, for Russia to prosecute some kind of campaign on the eastern flank. Um, even the allies on the eastern flank, truly, uh, nobody really thinks tomorrow the Russians are going to invade uh, Lithuania or Estonia or Poland, but they want to set the conditions that Russia never thinks twice about using that as a tool. They use all these other tools, as I mentioned, below the belt, um, but we want to uh, show by our deterrence and defensive strength that we're, um, we're standing up and ready to uh, thwart that. So the challenge remains these threat perceptions. We've argued in our recent uh, report that SIPA put out um, on the eastern flank. It's called uh, One Flank, One Threat, 
one presence. And that uh, report is all about coherence of our approach to Eastern flank defense and security, but as well in the rest of Europe, the Western uh, Alliance, um, getting a common view on threat perception. It's very hard to do, something that has to be attacked, something NATO has to address. And uh, we need um, more interaction. This trilat you mentioned is one of the formats that can sort of help uh, develop that common threat perception. That um, format you mentioned, Germany, Poland, the United States, allows those three very, very important allies to this region to come together to help, um, in my view, to help ensure the Germans really understand the, what the um, what the avenues of approach are, what the port, uh, uh, ratios are on the eastern flank, and what the Russian um, uh, continued uh, demonstrable activities are, because there's really a gap, or I don't, I don't know if you want to call it sort of head in the sand or hope, hope that the Russians won't do anything, but that's what it seems like in the western, when you get west of uh, uh, the Polish western border, uh, it, it seems like there's a hope uh, sort of uh, sense of what the Russians are going to do in the future. It needs to be addressed. All our formats is a way to do it. NATO needs to tackle this itself. They need to find new ways uh, to um, fully engage the sort of B9 or the Eastern flank allies, get Turkey uh, more on board with these threat uh, model developments, uh, and work uh, to ensure that um, we understand the common threat picture. Because if we don't do that, that's the basic level of building coherence in our response. And again, you can see there's clearly a, quite a bit of coherence because of the response we've demonstrated, but there needs to be much more and the Russians will continue to keep us on the back of our heels until we get that coherence and includes the threat uh, analysis and threat um, models and then the response uh, to our posture response, let's say, to those threats. Well, that was a very comprehensive answer, but I'm curious though, how come we're focusing so much on the Baltic Sea rather than the Black Sea? I mean, Russia recently annexed Crimea and has a base in Sevastopol and has used the Black Sea region to, um, to help its activities in Syria and also uh, has um, militarily been involved in Ukraine and Georgia. So everything is kind of focused in that region. So why is the Eastern flank uh, around the Baltic Sea receiving so much more attention? And do you think that that's wise for NATO? And um, which region do you think is strategically more important for Russia in the end? Yeah, so it's sort of the weakest link uh, approach uh, to the Eastern flank. A um, lot of turmoil politically in the um, with the allies and partners in the uh, Black Sea region. Uh, one of the earlier, we, we just go back to 2014, use that as a little bit of a starting point. Uh, really, the starting point, you have to go back to um, occupation of Moldova, in my view, and then Georgia, attacks, uh, cyber attacks in Estonia, uh, those kinds of things that happened uh, before 2010. But when you fast forward, you know, uh, those those things happened. Uh, NATO was maybe slowly waking up to this uh, revisionist uh, Russia. But by 2014, it was absolutely clear what Russia did in Ukraine. Now, NATO's response, uh, again, showed a lot of solidarity and coherence and the EU with the sanctions. But what happened was there was kind of a two-tiered approach uh, to the Baltic theater and to the Black Sea theater. And basically, we took what was called an enhanced forward presence view of the Baltics, which is a much more um, specific response and positioning of forces continuously in the Baltic region. And then in the um, southeastern region, Black Sea, we took a, a response uh, mechanism that we called a tailored uh, forward presence, which meant a little bit more ad hoc. We weren't exactly sure which ally was going to come and help Romania and Bulgaria and Black Sea or policing next, next time, next time, where up in the Baltics, it was very concrete. Now, one of the differences initially viewed in 2014 was the most vulnerable, especially for land uh, ground combat uh, areas in the, the whole eastern flank, was this small trip of land we call the Sabalki Corridor that uh, divides or is at the Polish-Lithuanian um, uh, border. 
And so uh, NATO saw that uh, clearly as a, uh, a weak link to easily uh, seal off three allies, but the Russians could easily uh, close that corridor. And so NATO went after that very hard. And meanwhile, uh, the Kaliningrad had already been strengthened over years and years, and now was getting strengthened further and further. Uh, what was happening in Crimea, Crimea and Donbass was happening, uh, but it was happening uh, more slowly. NATO's watching, EU is reacting. So there isn't this uh, sort of strong response that happened in the, in the Baltic Sea. Um, and again, because that, um, that ability for the Russians to instantly cut off three allies and then use Belarus as a natural platform uh, between Belarus uh, Lithu through Lithuania to uh, Kaliningrad uh, to basically run a major uh, campaign against NATO in the Northeast. So NATO responded to that. The other part of this is uh, up until that time, NATO very much um, still trying to find its way post all the NATO expansions. We still have um, limited NATO expansion going, the growth and enlargement of NATO, which is awesome to see North Macedonia and Montenegro come in in the last few years. Um, but, you know, NATO has uh, been struggling. Um, we can clearly see in its defense spending overall, in its, uh, you know, uh, debate about missions abroad versus its territorial defense. And so NATO was struggling with all these internal issues, always trying to um, uh, improve uh, its capabilities, but not being sure of the full mission set that was required. So that was a problem. So that that sort of limitation to NATO, this this what are, what are we all about uh, during this period, led to we need to um, uh, close uh, this uh, Putin's gap. We called it the Savalki quarter. What we wanted to keep open and when Putin's gap to close, we wanted to uh, prevent Putin from even thinking about that. And then we were gonna put sort of a ad hoc approach in the Black Sea, uh, keep it, um, uh, let Putin know we were there and we cared, uh, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't to the level that it should have been done. And clearly uh, today, and that's something SIPA very strongly uh, argues for, is a much more uh, strengthened uh, posture in the Black Sea region. And so overall, just to button up this question for you, overall, SEPA's uh, approach to the Eastern Flank is we need to get away from enhanced forward presence in the Baltic, uh, sort of uh, philosophically, and, this, and down in the Black Sea, uh, tailored forward presence. We need to have a uh, forward presence on NATO's Eastern Flank that's coherent, balanced, and responds to uh, the threats that the Russian poses. All right, so let's go back to the region of Poland, where you are and where you live. Tell us a little bit more about the current U.S.-Polish relationship and um, are making agreements on defense and uh, upping U.S. presence in Poland as Poland is, uh, as threat perception, as you know, is, uh, is quite heightened these days. But there seems to be a, a perception, at least, that perhaps the United States and Poland are making bilateral decisions on defense. Um, do you think that this is affecting the trust within NATO or is that just a um, misperception actually and that's not at all what's going on? Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so from um, my perspective, uh, all this uh, in the bilateral sphere is, uh, is good news. Uh, it's good news for Poland and the United States, good news for NATO. Um, and I think this is uh, not necessarily unusual that there's special specific uh, bilateral uh, or sometimes trilateral as we talked about earlier um, efforts going on um, because in a smaller format often or even bilaterally of course um, it's easier to get things done and get things done quickly so in the case of the United States and Poland U.S. relationship in my view has been pretty much uh, very very strong uh, you know for more than 200 years so um, there's been uh, of course interruptions when uh, Poland was trapped behind the Iron Curtain uh, but uh, you know from the beginning of the U.S. Uh, um, effort for independence Polish support to that and then you go into uh, the early 20th century with um, 25,000 Americans supporting Polish independence in the uh, uh, battle for Warsaw in the, in the Soviet uh, Polish War. Um, there's all these different episodes, and of course, Polish significant support to the West as the fourth 
largest allied force in World War II, it's uh, often forgotten that the escaped Polish uh, forces either to the east under Soviet banner or to the west under British flag uh, brought in, brought in uh, next to the United States, the Soviet Union, and Britain, the fourth largest allied um, contributing uh, army. Uh, but again, uh, Poland lost everything at the end of that period. And we get into the 1990s when Poland breaks away uh, from the, uh, the foot of the Soviet Union, uh, Poland immediately uh, rivets uh, towards the West, and especially the United States. So what we're seeing today, as your comment about that uh, defense security agreement, is, uh, is in a long pattern uh, of longer history, but specifically since 1989, uh, Poland's turn, hard turn to the West and towards the United States. And with that, Poland showed significant commitment every step of the way, every opportunity, uh, whether it was uh, supporting us in Desert Storm uh, already by 1990, 1991, uh, supporting us in Haiti in our operations there, uh, supporting us in the Balkans and NATO in the Balkans uh, fight, uh, significantly uh, capturing uh, Serbian war criminals, for example. And then by 2002, the fourth uh, or the third um, ally that would even show up on the day one of operations in Afghanistan. It was Poland. It was Poland, um, the UK, and Australia. The only three allies that showed up right next to us in uh, operations in Afghanistan in 2002. And then by 2003, same thing, a repeat. Australia, uh, UK, and Poland. So out of the rest of the alliance, uh, whether they had the capability or political will, those didn't match. For Poland, they matched. Now, so when we go in uh, to more recent times uh, with the advent uh, or the Russian revisionism, uh, Poland has been a leader in the region, pushing all kinds of uh, tough initiatives to um, convince NATO and the United States, really, uh, to strengthen the eastern flank. So Poland really been a leader on uh, sort of um, getting the, the discussion going of what needs to happen providing their uh, sort of, let's say, um, ideas on what the posture should look like. And those have varied over, over the last 10 years. Um, and then working those out. And of course, the key player, the, the, the army uh, that showed up immediately in the wake of uh, the Russian attacks in uh, Crimea was the United States. So the United States showed up early um, in April of 2014 um, and in March of 2014, the U.S. showed up with aircraft, and by April, we showed up with soldiers. And uh, Poland recognized that, and Poland recognized that the major player and influencer for NATO writ large, the big leader, is the United States, and the United States took the lead on the eastern flank. Poland is the leader, let's say, on the eastern flank, both capability uh, and, and political will, uh, took the reins of uh, trying to uh, cement that even closer and, um, and over the last uh, six or seven years has worked hard with the United States uh, to get to these agreements that we're at now. They really came about in the last year and a half. Uh, there's been three, two different declarations and then this agreement you mentioned called the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, uh, which has um, um, sort of codified uh, the U.S. Uh, posture that's going to uh, be continuous in Poland for the uh, extended future. Um, so I don't think those uh, have any negative impact on allied relationships in the region. For example, just uh, imagine 2019 when Poland actually was being criticized uh, for doing exactly what you said, doing these uh, close discussions with the United States. Why wasn't NATO involved? Some, some in Western NATO were you know, criticizing Poland. Um, at the same time, we deployed a uh, artillery brigade to Germany that had not been there in the past, and uh, nobody uh, went to NATO or coordinated with Montenegro to ask if that was a good idea to put that artillery brigade, uh, National Guard artillery brigade, in Germany. Um, it was just done. Germany and um, the United States worked it out. NATO was notified. We think we need this here. Uh, we reinforced other units in Germany over the last several years as well. And those were not uh, brought up as sort of larger NATO decisions. They were organized in a way as the U.S. response to the problems on the eastern flank, what we, what we were doing in Germany. Uh, and also in other places, in Belgium and Netherlands, for example, putting um, pre-positioned equipment. That um, was, you know, U.S. discussions with those countries. 
that had those um, capabilities previous to the storage, uh, we negotiated with them or renegotiated to use them, and we brought those in. And again, NATO was uh, part of the discussion, but NATO was not um, um, was not uh, making a decision on those. And so, this, in my view, it's the same thing out here. But um, because um, the the main, uh, I think, the main background topic here is a concern by Germany about how this looks vis-a-vis -vis the NATO Russia Founding Act, and there's still an effort uh, by some in the in the alliance to uh, want to adhere to the Western or the NATO view of the NATO Russia Founding Act, in spite of the fact that the Russians have abrogated the, the, the document entirely. So I think that's what's more at play out here. And that's just uncomfortable. You know, we have this uh, sort of more recent uh, member of uh, NATO, not too recent anymore, but 1999, Poland's aboard. And now we're, uh, you know, we're moving, uh, you know, forces uh, for extended stays into the region, and it's um, it looks like uh, you know Poland has uh, um, you know uh, it, it's all Poland's idea, and that's it's really not the case. And the U.S. and the Poland uh, came together on these uh, these um, concepts, let's say, uh, to strengthen the eastern flank using Poland as sort of an anchor point, and uh, and that's where we are. So in my view, it strengthens NATO. It actually is acts as a magnet. To convince uh, others in the alliance to participate more strongly in the region the eastern flank because we already know from history that generally when the u.s is there um others feel more comfortable about joining especially military missions uh, so that's part of it so i think poland and the united states working these out actually encourages nato to do more on the flank okay well thanks for clearing that up um, poland has as you said uh, been a reliable and committed member of the uh, of the alliance and uh, is one of the allies that commits the the two percent spending of their gdp on defense uh, something that president donald trump is very adamant about and something that we've been hearing about uh, on the news more often than in the past so uh, this could be, you know, Poland could be an example, as you said, for the rest of the allies to kind of um, be more committed to the efforts in the area. So the main, some of the main themes of this podcast series are to talk about great power competition, the transatlantic relationship and disinformation campaigns. And I like to ask everyone I interview about their perspectives on these major issues today and kind of tie the questions into what they do for a living. So in your case, do you think that in this era of great power competition that the US may prioritize the Asia Pacific at some point and therefore leave somewhat of a vacuum in Europe for Russia to fill? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well the United States uh, can't afford for sure to turn its back on uh, our allies and partners in the region and, and especially in this troubled period. But clearly, um, whether it's a de facto or not, uh, you know, discount the, uh, the bad terminology of the Asia pivot years ago, um, the United States has got to focus on the Asia theater. And so everything we can do as the United States and NATO to strengthen uh, NATO interoperability, NATO capabilities, so that if the United States is pulled into a conflict into the Asian theater, uh, whether it's a shooting war or something uh, along close to it, um, that uh, we have uh, in place here the ability uh, to hold the line, continue to deter Russia, whatever uh, forces uh, we, we have here. Now, clearly in the Asia theater, at least uh, initial uh, periods, more likely than not, uh, naval sea power and uh, air power will be the prominent uh, forces required unless it becomes we get into a shooting war somehow in, in uh, Korea, the Korea Peninsula. But with that, it, with that um, it, it does allow us to have some flexibility, maintain the sort of rotational ground forces that we continue to bring and focus on, um, on NATO's eastern flank. Of course, there's air power and sea power, it admissions. Um, so to uh, increase the chance of uh, there not being a miscalculation if the U.S. is focused in Asia, increase the chance that Putin does not make a miscalculation. It means the European pillar of security and defense has to be stronger. In order to do that, 
you know, I think we need to get beyond the the the, the war of words of either brain dead NATO or uh, we need a, another army in NATO. You know, the the sort of French uh, initiative. Um, EU army uh, kind of idea. There's nothing that's going to replace NATO as the preeminent um, security guarantor and uh, military um, capable alliance in, 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 in Europe. Uh, but anything below that, that the European Union does, for example, in military mobility, helping us get troops more quickly to the eastern flank, anything um, that individual countries or smaller format groups, whether it's PESCO, for example, they have a big project to deal with military mobility too. Um, anything that goes on in those spheres to strengthen the um, European pillar of defense and security, for, again, from our view, SEPA's view, my view personally, that's all good. But anything that undermines the coherence and cohesion of NATO, European initiatives that would uh, say that we need to you know, reimagine NATO or do something different with NATO, uh, that's wrongheaded. Uh, and we have a 75 year track record or um, actually, I'm sorry, 70 year track record, 71 uh, with NATO. Um, and it's uh, really um, successful uh, ro role as an alliance. And so therefore, um, uh, what we're doing now uh, in interoperability training, actually huge training exercises, uh, this new Defender series that started uh, this year, for example, of uh, bringing U uh, significant U.S. forces uh, over to um, the region uh, through Germany, other ports, and then into the region was a little bit uh, limited because of COVID-19, of course, but a lot was still accomplished with Defender 20. I'm going to repeat that in uh, 2021, U.S. leading a major allied effort in Defender 2021, focused more in the South East region, Black Sea, which is good. Back to the point you made, you know, where we focus, Black Sea, Baltic Sea, and so forth. Um, the idea of Defender is actually to alternate uh, those two sub theaters uh, every other year uh, to strengthen the um, interoperability and test all these movement networks that we have. Today. So, um, but at the heart of it, there is a there is the um, there is the concern that the United States has a big job in Asia and it's growing. Um, besides, you know, physical presence and military capabilities, we need to worry about and and strengthening alliances in Asia. What we also need to do is to look at the Chinese threat, the Chinese government, the People's Republics. Uh, and President Xi um, efforts in Europe. Often forgotten as we talk about Russia and what's happening on the Eastern flank and Russia undermining uh, NATO cohesion and coherence is the fact that uh, the Chinese, not, not so overtly, but more in an economic way, are uh, setting the stage, setting the stage for future uh, political warfare with Europe and the United States or dividing Europe from the United States. They have as many tentacles uh, reaching into Europe and trying to separate allies from uh, sort of the Western alliance system, whether it's 5G that we need to worry about, the threat of uh, Chinese 5G, Huawei and so forth, state-run companies, or um, this Belt and Road Initiative, which we're so happy to see the Three Cs Initiative, which is not exactly a total counter to the Belt and Road, but it certainly is a way to strengthen allied and, and, and Western European um, connectivity and economic uh, potential um, with this big Western initiative. Uh, so those kinds of things, besides the military strengthening, strengthening NATO, uh, EU uh, military posture, defense and security capabilities, these economic, um, energy uh, related uh, infrastructure activities, uh, for example, of the three Cs, are other ways that we need to increase uh, the solidarity, cohesion, coherence of the West. Uh, to thwart not just uh, the Russia problem, but the geopolitical problem that you uh, you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. These initiatives are vital for you know the closer ties because we can't risk to undermine the health and stability of the alliance and the relationship, especially these days when we're seeing the rise of other powers that risk to. Uh, change or destabilize the um, Western-led international order and the values that founded that very order. And um, a few times you mentioned throughout uh, this, uh, this interview, this podcast, that the Russian threat is, um, you know, is in, a, in a kind of a hybrid form. So there's some propaganda going on, dissemination of propaganda and um, 
kind of not direct military threats necessarily, but some other basically, as I mentioned, hybrid um, threats. So would you be able to explain to the audience the threat of Russian disinformation for European security and what we can do together to counter that threat? So on the propaganda, political warfare, disinfo level, uh, significant threat. And the Russians have really um, been uh, uh, showing uh, how capable they are at this. You know, the Russians, if you listen to uh, our Russia expert, uh, Brian Whitmore, and, and then Don Jensen, um, formerly at uh, SIPA, um, uh, Don Jensen wrote a, um, wrote a, uh, a report uh, about a year ago called uh, Chaos, as strategy, and basically, it uh, it talks about uh, this sort of uh, hybrid warfare campaign, and that how the disinfo political warfare is used at every single level, whether it's at the you know uh, senior peer-to-peer uh, -peer level. You think about all the times that Putin's met with American leaders, and we have thought that we were going to turn the page on something, and it turns out. Um, we think one thing and the Russians do something else. That's one. Just the propaganda and face-to-face -face, uh, executive uh, leader level. And then um, when we get down to the allies, dividing the allies uh, up, and, and the most demonstrable remains uh, this Nord Stream 2 uh, problem. And this idea that uh, somehow this is just uh, an energy deal and Germany um, being coaxed into looking the other way at all the political ramifications and all the energy security ramifications. That, that propaganda, that ability of Gazprom and the Russian uh, political apparatus to um, so, um, so uh, doubt into what Nord Stream 2 is really all about, uh, not just an energy deal, I think is significant because when we have the most powerful, richest nation in Europe, Germany, um, uh, falling uh, to the um, the Russian story on what gas or or believing in spite of uh, the reality. Um, so it's 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 uh, it's significant. The threats uh, by Russia, uh, whether under underneath or as part of the propaganda warfare or the disinfo, are significant and it's divided. We have um, uh, governments um, all over Europe, uh, with uh, even within the governments, mixed views on how to deal with Russia. I mean, just look at the two different uh, sort of views in the Czech Republic, a key ally in Central Europe, um, and uh, in, the, in the president, prime minister um, kind of differences on how they look at Russia. Bulgaria, you know, going back to the Black Sea, three allies uh, and several partners, um, but we have three allies with uh, very strong different views about Russia. Romania uh, probably, you know, is de facto the centerpiece for us in the Black Sea uh, because of their political will, uh, but not certainly for their military capability. Uh, it's great to see Romania trying to build and strengthen, and it's important. Uh, geographically, they're in a key place, but really, um, Ukraine or Turkey, if they were both politically, you know, in, in the case of Turkey, the strongest uh, military in NATO, besides, uh, in Europe, um, the most, uh, the largest, uh, should be on our um, front lines in the Black Sea. But really, there's a lot of uh, a disagreement about how we're going to uh, deal with Russia in the Black Sea, the Black Sea, NATO Lake, the Russia Lake, um, the Neutral Lake, and so um, and this is part of the Russian um, uh, uh, sort of. Uh, um, underneath a uh, hybrid campaign, um, tying in Turk Street 1, Turk Street 2, big deals with Erdogan uh, on uh, air defense, and therefore um, they've uh, convinced the Turks that they either need to balance um, their relationships with Russia and NATO, or that uh, Russia is their better friend. I'm not sure which one, but uh, again, uh, referring to a General Hodges point, this is where uh, we need to stand strong as NATO and sort of have a, uh, a U.S.-NATO uh, 2.0 reboot of our relationship with Turkey. How that, how that goes and what the steps are, I can't, I can't, I can't tell you, but we need to do something because uh, they're the essential ally in the Black Sea. So uh, anyway, Russia's ability uh, to use these tools, uh, the propaganda, um, is uh, significant. They've used it since 2014 very strongly. I've seen it very personally working in the embassy of what they've done to uh, so try to sow um, discord in the Polish uh, uh, government and the media 
by uh, uh, sending out uh, disinformation about what's happening with our troops on the ground. For example, um, you know, uh, saying that some falsely accusing American soldiers of, uh, you know, raping uh, some uh, Polish uh, uh, girl uh, somewhere, getting into bar fights, uh, that the, the Americans are here as uh, occupiers and, you know, all those kinds of stories. Uh, thankfully, because the strong Polish American alliance and, and Poland's uh, great uh, role in, in the West and NATO, uh, the Poles generally don't buy into that. But there are other states in the region with uh, Russian minorities, when we talk about the Baltics, uh, that the Russians can use um, ethnic and, uh, and um, um, their uh, relationships with these uh, minorities to also try to sow discord within the po body politic of these states. Uh, so that's always a concern as well. There's some states that are more resilient and some that are not. So what needs to happen is all these organizations that are involved, uh, whether it's the you know Cyber Defense uh, uh, Center of Excellence in uh, Estonia, the uh, Strategic Communication Center of Excellence in Latvia, the Hybrid Center in uh, Helsinki, all these different efforts by the EU uh, or individual countries or uh, uh, NATO, uh, in our sort of uh, review and study of what's happening with these things, uh, they are not all sort of tied in together. This is a part of uh, the democratic uh, um, system. And, and because of um, our inability to sort of link all these efforts together and get more synergy out of them to counter Russia, um, we're back on our heels still in the propaganda war. So the Russians uh, have made significant progress. Uh, we have started to stand up all these centers and started to stand up to be more offensive but I think we need an even more offensive approach um, back to the sort of uh, um, approach we had with uh, the Cold War with Radio Free Europe, Voice of America approach uh, to the Warsaw Pact. Um, we don't have that coherent approach. I'll just give you one example and finish here is uh, in Belarus. Um, there's very limited exposure by the Belarusians to Western uh, style, uh, precise, accurate media. And what has happened is the Russian outlets or the Belarusian outlets that are Russian supported um, with all their glitz and glamour are the ones that are uh, attention is paid to in Belarus. Efforts like Belsats, which is a uh, Polish, um, uh, Polish uh, UK partnership uh, to get uh, accurate news to the Belarusian in their language um, is a great uh, example of a positive effort, but uh, it doesn't have the funding and the glitz and glamour of all the Russia Today and other uh, kinds of things that the Belarusians are more apt to watch, and therefore it's not reaching a very big audience. There are a variety of different threats that we need to look out for, and um, prop propaganda dissemination really risks uh, to undermine the cohesion of the alliance and of of uh, the European Union and of the United States. And it's a very powerful tool. And as you said, we seem to be lagging behind the Russians and the Chinese in this uh, area as of late. Um, as you mentioned, Russia Today has a huge budget, incredible, almost like that of the BBC. I looked it up the other day. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, as we saw during the coronavirus pandemic, for example, so much dissemination of this information, uh, you know, that the Chinese are being so much more helpful than the West in certain regions of Europe and um, portraying the West as completely absent and not helping anyone at all. It's, um, it's, it's, it's challenging, but we certainly need to do um, or make efforts to, to counter that challenge and to, to change the narrative so that uh, this narrative doesn't take over. So yes. great, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk with me today. I thank you for being here. Uh, I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks again, Suzanne. Thanks for this uh, great project you're uh, organized. And uh, all the best at George uh, Marshall Center. Uh, thousands of Poles have uh, been trained there at this point and uh, all over the rest of uh, uh, the new uh, you know, post-Soviet uh, space have been sent and, and or uh, have been sent uh, uh, instructors 
uh, on uh, democratic practices and uh, uh, defense reform and so on and so forth, countering terrorism. So the work that the Marshall Center continues to do and that great German-American partnership um, is absolutely phenomenal. We need to keep strengthening uh, that as well. That's another uh, one of these lesser known uh, efforts that's out there. There probably is a lot more potential. And again, I applaud your leadership in that German, Polish, American tribe. Another example of something, you know, kind of born out of uh, the great Marshall Center. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for uh, for the promotional uh, last couple of minutes. And uh, to our audience, thank you so much for tuning in to Security in the 21st Century. And don't forget to tune in to the next episode.